So first, the first question is, who is a Rishi according to Swami Vivekananda? He wrote a Bengali essay. What we have of his complete works, we have nine volumes, most of which are lectures, especially given in English in the West, and sometimes in India also. But he also wrote some pieces, and those pieces are especially important because, as everyone knows, it takes more sort of concentration and rigor to write something than to just say something as a lecture. And so this is an especially important essay, and he wrote this on Sri Ramakrishna, in, originally in Bengali, and this is a rough translation into English. So the original Bengali essay is called Hindu Dharma or Sri Ramakrishna, Hinduism and Sri Ramakrishna. And in the very beginning of this very important essay, he explains, he defines the concept of Rishihood. So let's look at it carefully as a way to start thinking deeply about what Rishihood means, what it means to be a Rishi. Truth is of two kinds. One, that which is cognizable by the five ordinary senses of man and by inferential reasoning based thereon. Two, that which is cognizable by the subtle, supersensuous power born of yoga. The original Bangla is Jaha Atindriya Shukho Jogajo Shuktir Grajo. Knowledge acquired by the first means is called science. The Bangla here is Bigyan, Sanskrit Vigyana. And knowledge acquired by the second is called Veda. The whole body of supersensuous truths, Jnana Rashi, having no beginning or end and called by the name of Veda is ever existent and the creator himself is creating, preserving and destroying the universe with the help of these truths. And he continues, the person in whom this super sensuous power, what he calls Atindriya Shakti, Atindriya Shakti, is manifested, is manifested, it is called a Rishi. And the supersensuous truths, alokika satya, which he or she realizes by this power, are called Veda. The attainment of this Rishihood and the supersensuous perception of Veda is the true experiential verification of religion. A Rishitto o Veda Dashtritva Lab Korai Jatato Dharmanubhuti. And so long as this does not develop in the life of an initiate, so long is religion a mere empty word to him. And it is to be understood that he has not yet taken the first step in religion. The authority of Veda extends to all ages, climes, and persons. That is to say, its application is not confined to any particular place, time, or person. So this is a very important statement of Swami Vivekananda's about what is a Rishi and what is Rishihood. So let's start unpacking that passage that I just read. So first of all, Vivekananda is saying that one becomes a Rishi by attaining the super sensuous knowledge of what he calls the Veda. And here we all know that Veda means the, the Hindu scriptures, but Vivekananda is doing something very interesting here. He's defining Veda not as the Hindu scriptures but as what he calls the whole body of supersensuous truths including God and the divinity of the soul. So he's defining Veda in a much broader manner that encompasses all of the supersensuous truths recorded, recorded in all of the world's religious scriptures. So this is not just Hindu but universal. And then he explains Rishihood. What is Rishihood? Rishihood is not a Hindu ideal, it's a universal human ideal. That's what he emphasizes again and again. He says anyone and everyone can and should become a Rishi. And according to Vivekananda, the aim of all religions, not just Hinduism, but Christianity, Islam, Buddhism, is the attainment of Rishihood. Now, another very important concept that I would call it a doctrine actually of Vivekananda is what he calls the science of religion. So I want to contextualize that first and you'll see the relevance to the concept of Rishihood soon, I hope. So during Vivekananda's time, that was the late 19th century, there was tremendous conflict between science and religion. So in 1859, Charles Darwin, he published Origin of Species, which proposes this theory of evolution. 
and that precipitated a crisis of religious belief, especially in the Western world, because according to Christianity, there's this creation theory, and Darwin's theory just seemed to throw everything into confusion, throw everything into doubt. And it was in that context that Swami Vivekananda visited the West in the 1890s, from 1893 to 1901. And it was in that context that he was trying to harmonize science and religion, put religion on a new scientific footing. But just to give you a, a sense of the historical context at the time that Swami Vivekananda was discussing the science of religion, in 1860, the prominent British scientist Thomas Henry Huxley he memorably remarked that, quote, extinguished theologians lie about the cradle of every science as the strangled snakes beside that of Hercules. So this is typical. There is a sense that with the advent of modern science and especially Darwin's evolutionary theory and many other modern theories, that science has won the day and that religion takes a backseat to science and it's been proven to be out, outmoded, outdated somehow falsified by, by the findings of science. And it was in this context that Swami Vivekananda came and he tried to put religion on a new footing, on a new scientific footing, tried to harmonize science and religion in a new, in a new way by defending the scientific credentials of religion, by claiming that religion itself is a science. So how does he do that? He does it via the concept of rishihood. He says, the rishi is a spiritual scientist one who experientially verifies the truth of religion. Just as a natural scientist, remember in that passage that I read earlier, vigyana, that was the word he used for science, the natural sciences. And veda is a term that includes spiritual science, that encompasses spiritual science. So just as a natural scientist verifies a hypothesis about the natural world through an experiment, spiritual scientists, yogis, rishis, they do the same thing. They conduct similar experiments, but regarding supersensuous truths, truths like God, truths like the soul. And it's significant that he, that Swami Vivekananda refers to this phrase, the science of religion, 13 times in the complete works. And it's something that we don't discuss very frequently, but I think it's an extremely important concept to understand the concept of rishihood in Swami Vivekananda's thought. Now, the moment that Vivekananda, or anyone else for that matter, claims that religion is based on supersensuous knowledge, there's a very intuitive objection that many people raise, especially these days with modern education. Why should we believe that supersensuous knowledge is even possible? Why should we believe that it exists in the first place? You'll find that Vivekananda again and again, he says that the Rishi is one who has attained supersensuous knowledge of ultimate reality. I've already read one passage. I'll read one brief passage which says the same thing. He says, how comes then the knowledge with the, which the Vedas declare? It comes through being a Rishi. This knowledge is not in the senses, but are the senses the be all and the end all of the human being? Who dare say that the senses are the all in all in man, the all in all of man? So he says this again and again, that there's supersensuous knowledge, that religion is based on supersensuous knowledge. But many people these days, educated people, scientists, they're going to say that, wait a minute, but why should we accept the possibility of supersensuous knowledge? And they might go on to say, even if many mystics and saints claim to have attained supersensuous knowledge, why should we believe them in the first place? And I've heard this from many of my peers, from scientists. They say, well, their, experience, their experiences could just be subjective hallucinations. How do we know that they're actually accessing something objective, something objectively real or true? So if we can use a pun. Rishis are fishy. That would be the objection. We have no good reason to believe the testimony of rishis. This is the objection. So how does Swami Vivekananda respond to this objection? Uh, well, before we get to how he responds, let me, so that's the kind of intuitive popular objection that many people make that I've heard from many scientists and other people. But in the scholarly sphere, the academic sphere, there are a number of scholars who take Vivekananda to task precisely for this reason. Um, these scholars claim that Vivekananda dogmatically assumed the possibility of supersensuous knowledge. Dogmatically meaning uncritically just taking it for granted that supersensuous knowledge is possible, but not proving that it's possible. So I'll, I'm giving you two examples here. C. Mackenzie Brown, 
an American scholar. He says, for Vivekananda, personal experiences of sages like Kapila are accepted as infallible without critical assessment of such experiences, without awareness that experiences are largely inseparable from personal and cultural interpretation. This is from a, a book he wrote in 2012. And another scholar, Anantanand Rambachan, he wrote a book called The Limits of Scripture in 1994. The whole book is a criticism of Swami Vivekananda's philosophy. And he has a chapter where he attacks Vivekananda's conception of science, the science of religion. So he claimed, he argues that Vivekananda wrongly conceives religion as a science since spiritual experiences are not an objective source of knowledge. So these are familiar criticisms in the academic world. So now, how do we defend Vivekananda against these kinds of criticisms? That's what I want to explore for the remainder of this presentation. So I want to argue that these kinds of criticisms of Vivekananda are not fair because he does, in fact, present a sophisticated and original philosophical argument for the epistemic value of supersensuous perception in his text, Raja Yoga. What do I mean by epistemic value? This is a technical term that's used in epistemology and philosophy of religion. The idea is he presents an argument that supersensuous perception, perception of supersensuous realities like God and the soul, is a source of knowledge. That's what epistemic value means. And to my knowledge, no scholar no one, for that matter, uh, that I've ever run into, including the monks in my order, has even acknowledged, let alone grappled with, this argument in Vivekananda's work. So that's what I want to summarize briefly today, this argument that he makes. And to, to contextualize it, I'll just give you a little bit of uh, philosophical background. One of the most pressing problems in post-Kantian Western philosophy was the following. Even if God exists, is it possible for us to know God? And Vivekananda was a student of philosophy at Scottish Church College in the late 19th century in Kolkata. And so he studied a lot of Western philosophers like Kant and Herbert Spencer. He even wrote a letter, I believe, to Herbert Spencer. Um, and so he knew that Immanuel Kant in the Critique of Pure Reason and Herbert Spencer, that they answered this question in the negative. They said that no, it's not even, God might exist or he might not exist, but it's not possible for us human beings with our limited cognitive faculties to know God. So according to Kant and Spencer, while it is necessary and valuable for us to have faith in God, we can never have knowledge of God. So they distinguish faith and knowledge. They say we can have faith in God, but that's a kind of blind faith. And we can never have knowledge of God. This was their assumption. It was a kind of agnosticism. Where should I point? Okay. Oh boy. <laughs> All right. So in contrast to these philosophers, philosophers like Kant and Spencer who are more agnostic, Vivekananda defends an affirmative answer to the question. He says it is possible to know God. And he doesn't just assert it dogmatically, but he argues for that. And he does so as follows, in a number of places in his complete works, he ingeniously argues for the epistemic value of supersensuous perception, that is, that supersensuous perception is a source of knowledge. On the basis of the traditional Mimamsa doctrine of Swatav Pramanyata, this is a very technical doctrine and I'm not gonna go into it in detail here, I just wanted to flag it. If you want more details, I'm gonna mention it in the last slide of this presentation, a book of mine that's coming out next month where I discuss this in detail. But this is the Mimamsa doctrine um, of the intrinsic validity of cognitions. And he bases his argument for supersensuous perception as knowledge on this, doc this Mimamsa doctrine, which is quite interesting. All right, so how does this argument work that I'm claiming nobody was aware of? So let's start with a quotation. He says, what is the proof of God? Direct perception, pratyaksha. The proof of this wall is that I perceive it. God has been perceived that way by thousands before and will be perceived by all who want to perceive him. 
But this perception is no sense perception at all. It is super sensuous, super conscious. So this contains in a nutshell what I call his principle of perceptual proof. I'll just abbreviate it as PP. Um, so according to Vivekananda, direct perception serves equally as the, quote, proof of God and the proof of this wall. That is, if I am justified in believing that there is a wall in front of me because I perceive that wall, I am also justified in believing that God exists because I perceive him. This is the fundamental principle. So, so the idea is very intuitive, right? How do I know that this podium exists? Well, because I'm perceiving it right now. How do I know the wall exists? Because I'm perceiving it. Vivekananda says that there is an underlying epistemic principle that is absolutely indispensable in our everyday lives that every one of us takes for granted in order to just navigate this world, in order to get up from my bed, in order to have breakfast, in order to go to work. You have to accept this epistemic principle, this principle that I'm calling the principle of perceptual proof. So we, what is that principle? The principle is we ordinarily take our sensory perceptions to be proof that what we perceive actually exists. So as he puts it, the proof of this wall is that I perceive it. And this everyday behavior is justified, he claims, on the basis of the following general epistemic principle. This is a quotation from Raja Yoga. Whatever we see and feel is proof if there has been nothing to delude the senses. So this is the principle that I'm calling the principle of perceptual proof, PP. And to put it slightly more technically, in sort of philosophical language, in the absence of reasons for doubting the veridicality of my perception, my perception of X makes it reasonable for me to believe that X exists. So the term veridicality, if you're not familiar with it, um, it just means that the perception makes contact with an objective reality. So unless I have reasons for doubting, so let's say that I ingested some hallucinogenic drug recently, and then I start seeing a snake in front of me. Then I have a good reason to doubt my perception of the snake because I just ingest ingested that drug. But in the absence of reasons to doubt my perception, it's reasonable to believe that what I perceive actually exists. Regardless of what the object of perception is, that's what's really important to keep in mind here. So this is where, again, Vivekananda is very creatively, my goodness, he's very creatively engaging with and drawing on traditional Indian philosophies. So Vivekananda, what he's doing is he, he holds that direct perception, this pramana of pratyaksha, encompasses both sensory perception, indriya pratyaksha, and super sensuous perception, yoga pratyaksha. And this is not unique to Vivekananda. This, is, this goes way back to the Nayayikas, Sankhya Yoga, and Poshankara Advaita Vedantins like Dharma Raja, Vedanta Paribhasha. And he says this again and again. For instance, he says that he refers to the direct perception of yogis and rishis who claim to have attained knowledge beyond the senses. So remember that when, he's when Vivekananda talks about perception, he th he's thinking of two different kinds of perception primarily. One is sense perception, perception of chairs and tables and podiums, and super sensuous perception, perception of super sensuous realities like God and the soul. So that's the first key premise in Vivekananda's argument in defense of the epistemic value of supersensuous perception. And the second key premise in this argument is what I call the principle of testimonial proof. It's linked to the previous principle, the principle of perceptual proof. So let's start with this quotation again from Raja Yoga. He says, Aptavakya, the direct evidence of the yogis, of those who have seen the truth. His, the yogi's words are proof because he sees knowledge in himself. These yogis, for instance, are the authors of the sacred scriptures. Therefore, the scriptures are proof. If any such persons are living now, their words will be proof. So what he's saying is that the testimony of what he calls an apta, which is, again, a term that goes way back in the Sanskrit philosophical literature, it just means a credible person. So the testimony of an apta about her perception of some entity constitutes proof for others that that entity exists. So this is the principle that I'm calling the principle of testimonial proof, which I'll abbreviate as TP. 
And again, just as Vivekananda argued that PP, the principle of perceptual proof, that when I, when I perceive a wall, I'm justified in thinking that that wall exists, for instance, that PP, just as PP, the principle of perceptual proof, is indispensable in our everyday lives, just so is TP, the principle of testimonial proof, also indispensable. How is it indispensable? If I'm trying to get to a store and I'm new to the area and I get lost and I don't know how to get to the store, what do I do? I find someone walking on the street and I say, uh, hello sir, can you tell me where the store is? And he'll say, oh, you just have to take a left here and then go take a right here. And then I follow his instructions and I get to the store. Why do I believe him? I believe him because I have no good reason to distrust his testimony. Why would he <laughs> want to deceive me? There might be a reason, but it's very unlikely. And so in the absence of reasons for doubting that we gain a massive amount of knowledge. We, we get most of our knowledge, arguably, from testimony. So, now, Vivekananda makes a similar move with regard to TP as he does with PP. He says that if we accept PP and TP, and again, here, testimony includes two different kinds of testimony. One is testimony about sense perception, like the person giving me directions to the store because that person has perceived the store and he's saying here's how you can also get to the store. And also there's testimony about super sensuous perception. I have realized God. Vivekananda at a young age, most of you know this I'm sure, when he was a teenager he was going around from one yogi to another like Devendranath Tagore and then finally Ramakrishna and he was saying, have you seen God? Have you seen God? And Devendranath Tagore said, he said, I haven't seen God but you have the eyes of a yogi. And then he went to Paramahamsa Ramakrishna and he asked the same question, have you seen God? And then Sri Ramakrishna said, yes, I've seen God. I, and I feel him more intensely. I know he is, it's, it, the, my, my, my experience of God is more, it makes God feel more real to me than my experience of seeing you or my experience of this, you know, the people in front of me. So that's an example of spiritual testimony, mystical testimony. So, Vivekananda claims that if we accept these two epistemic principles, which are fairly uncontroversial in our everyday lives, then the words of a yogi who claims to have perceived a supersensuous reality constitute proof for others that that supersensuous reality exists. On the basis of this principle of testimonial proof, he further claims that the scriptures are proof. Why are the scriptures proof? Because the optas include, quote, the authors of the sacred scriptures. What are the scriptures themselves but just the record, the testimony of the great, the great seers and sages who are talking about what they themselves have directly realized, what super sensuous realities they have perceived. So on the basis of these two principles, Vivekananda concludes, quote, there is knowledge beyond the senses, and whenever it does not contradict reason and past human experience, that knowledge is proof. So this is a, it's just a general summary of the argument. Um, there are much more complicated details which I discuss in my book, which I'll mention at the end. So just to summarize the argument, he argues that if we accept certain uncontroversial epistemic principles, namely the principle of perceptual proof and the principle of testimonial proof, then it is reasonable for us to accept the testimony of credible mystics who claim to have perceived a supersensuous reality such as God or the soul. This is what I call Vivekananda's argument for the epistemic value of spiritual experience. We can abbreviate this as AEV. Now we can come back to Rambachan's main criticism of Vivekananda's doctrine of the science of religion. So I'm going to read a passage from his book, The Limits of Scripture, that book that attacks Vivekananda's philosophy. So, Rambachan says the following, he says, I've referred from time to time in this discussion to Vivekananda's attempts to equate the gain and verification of knowledge through Raja Yoga 
with the methods employed in science. So what he's doing is he's directly attacking Vivekananda's doctrine that religion itself is a science. The grounds, however, on which he draws his parallels leave many questions unanswered. Vivekananda's analogy with science is basically an analogy between religious experience and sense perception. The assumption is that both are verifiable in the same way. Almost all his examples, as well as his terminology, are drawn from the world of sense perception. There appear, however, to be very important differences between sensory experience and religious experience. So this is one of his many criticisms, but since I have limited time, I just wanted to focus on this and see how the AEV, the argument for the epistemic value of mystical experience that I just outlined, how that helps us respond to Rambachan's critique of Vivekananda. So according to Rambachan, Vivekananda argues for the scientific status of religion by establishing parallels between religious experience and sense perception. And this argument, Rambachan claims, is based on the assumption that both types of experience are verifiable in the same way. This is the claim that Rambachan is imputing to Vivekananda. And on that basis, Rambachan proceeds to point out some of the, quote, very important differences between sensory experience and religious experience since he thinks that establishing these differences is sufficient to undermine Vivekananda's case for the scientific credentials of religion. So this is somewhat technical, but I wanted to get into the weeds a little bit so we can really understand what's going on here. All right, so now, with, the, with AEV in the background, what I just discussed earlier in the presentation, with this argument for the epistemic value of spiritual experience in the background, I think we can see that Rambachan makes two serious mistakes in his criticism of Vivekananda. What is the first mistake? First, Rambachan claims that Vivekananda assumes that sensory experience and spiritual experience are both, quote, verifiable in the same way. However, that's false. He doesn't present any textual evidence in support of the claim, and in fact, Vivekananda explicitly denies this assumption, insisting rather that, quote, this is one of many quotations, he says, each science must have its own methods of verification. So that directly contradicts the claim that Rambachan is imputing to Vivekananda. So for Vivekananda, the physical sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, and the science of religion share a common basis in experiential verification. You can verify certain hypotheses on the basis of experience. But he argues that just as the methods for verifying claims in astronomy and chemistry differ, methods for verifying religious claims also differ quite naturally from verificatory methods in the other sciences. He gives very simple examples. He says, he says you know, if, I'm, if I want to analyze or e examine a distant star, I'm not going to use a microscope r like you use in biology. I'm going to use a telescope, naturally, right? So in the field of biology, microscopes are often necessary. In the field of astronomy, telescopes are necessary. In the field of chemistry, you need test tubes and you need chemicals, right? So every, every natural science needs specific methods to conduct its experiments. Naturally, then, in the science of religion, it's going to require its own specific methods for verification. That's the idea. So I think Rambachan is seriously wrong in, in claiming that Vivekananda claims that sensor, sensory experience and spiritual experience are both verifiable in the same way. That's the first mistake I think he makes. The second mistake, Rambachan assumes that Vivekananda's entire case for the scientific status of religion rests on establishing what he calls parallels. This is Rambachan's word, parallels between sensory experience and religious experience. Rambachan seems to think that, Ram, uh, that Vivekananda, he doesn't argue for the, the, the scientific status of religion. What he, he just says that, well, spiritual experience is basically, it's very similar to sense experience, and because we all accept sensory experience as a source of knowledge, therefore we, also accept spirit, we should also accept spiritual experience as a source of knowledge. But Rambachan completely ignores AEV, the argument that I outlined earlier in the presentation. Vivekananda presents these parallels between sense experience and spiritual experience only in support of his broader argument for the epistemic value of spiritual experience, AEV, which Rambachan completely ignores. I don't think he was aware of it. Vivekananda tries to demonstrate that mystical experiences are sufficiently similar to sensory experiences 
by being perceptions, immediate perceptions of some kind of entity. In order to establish that both kinds of experience, mystical experience and sensory experience, are perceptual in nature, that's the, that's the key move that Vivekananda makes in the argument. If spiritual experience is a kind of perception, and all of us take for granted certain epistemic principles about perception, PP and TP, remember the abbreviations, then it is reasonable for us also to believe that spiritual experience is a source of knowledge on the basis of the testimony of the great rishis and yogis. So this is Vivekananda's reasoning. If Vivekananda is able to establish the plausibility of this premise, then the epistemic principles PP and TP would apply equally to sensory perception and supersensuous perception. It applies to all perceptions. And he would then be in a position to defend the epistemic value of supersensuous perception on the basis of these two principles, PP and TP. Vivekananda's AEV then is the linchpin for establishing religion as a science based on direct experiential verification. And as I already mentioned, the, the most serious mistake that Rambachan makes in his chapter attacking Vivekananda's science of religion is that he doesn't even acknowledge the existence of this argument. And on that note, um, I'll just mention that what I just discussed briefly and summarily and without much rigor now, um, I discuss in much more detail in a book that's going to be published next month called Swami Vivekananda's Vedantic Cosmopolitanism. It'll be published by Oxford University Press uh, on January 6th, first in the US, and then I think by the end of February, an Indian, uh, a South Asian edition will be published in India at a more affordable price. Uh, so if you're interested in more details, please uh, look at that book. And I'd like to hear from you now. Thank you so much. So questions, I guess, right? Do we have time? I don't know. Okay, no, no time for questions. Okay, one or two questions. Go ahead. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a nice question. You're you're asking the the credibility of yeah. Go ahead and ask the question again, just so everyone can hear. Okay, I'm saying that uh, this proof of testimony doesn't it believe or uh, depend on the number of people believing in the same thing. Yeah. Thereby, there's a consensus of that proof. Yeah, that, that's a nice question. So the question is, won't won't the credibility of the testimony be strengthened if multiple people give the same kind of testimony. And I think that's right, yeah. But again, it's not always necessary. Consensus is not, when I'm asking for directions, I don't, I don't I, if I ask one person, I don't then go and ask five other people to make sure that the store is in the place that, we j I just take for granted that the first person who gave me the directions is, is true. But in the case of spiritual matters, I think you're right that the more people that testify to the reality of certain supersensuous truths, the stronger that testimonial, uh, that testimony becomes. I think that's absolutely right. So that's why Vivekananda says again and again, mystics in all cultures and in all religions and in all traditions and across ages, they have made the same testimony. They have all claimed to have experienced an ultimate reality, right? They might differ on the, de on the nature of that ultimate reality. Some people call it Allah, some people call it Vishnu, some people call it Christ, some people call it Brahman. But that there is an ultimate reality is very strongly attested to by the fact that there's t a, a, a massive amount of testimony across religious traditions. So thank you very much. That's a nice question. Thank you, Swami. Yeah. Namaskar Maharaj. Thank you for that very interesting presentation. My question is, uh, how do you look at the concept of reform in uh, uh, navigating through the forces of modernity uh, when it comes to dealing with institutions, customs, which are based on Abdavakya or uh, the testimony that you discussed in your presentation? Thank you. Okay. So if I understand your, correct, uh, your question correctly, you're asking how can we 
sort of um, develop our educational curricula in academic institutions? Is that what you're asking about? Academic institutions or? or by institutions, I mean, uh, for example, the institution of marriage. So we have a lot of people, for example, in uh, uh, Kolkata, who are trying to uh, redefine the, 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 the customs, rituals, uh, uh, which are attached to the concept of marriage uh, and wedding in particular. Uh, for example, Kanyadana is being done away with by several people. So uh, because the rituals of marriage are uh, based on certain sections of the Shruti, so how do we uh, look at those attempts to reform uh, rituals and customs? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. Um, the thing is, different people have different beliefs about these things. And it's, you know, I, I don't think it's even worth trying to persuade everybody to see things the way you see things, right? Because that, there's so many different people are testifying different things. Some people accept the Vedas, other people will reject the Vedas. And so it becomes, even among the Hindus, there's that kind of um, difference. So it gets tricky. And if you just throw a book at somebody, that usually doesn't really work, right? They'll say, well, I have my own book. So that gets complicated. And it's better not to force things down people's throats. That's, that's my feeling. Um, the best way to renew the validity and power of our great ancient spiritual testimony is to, is to have those experiences ourselves. So the, the credibility of testimony is renewed the more people in the present day have the kinds of spiritual experiences that those great rishis have had in the past. So I think the duty is incumbent on each of us to become a rishi. I think that's part of the ideal of rishihood university and that's why I became a monk. That's the, the aim of life according to Hinduism. The aim of life is not dharma artha or, you know, or kama, but moksha. That's the highest goal, which is each one of us must become a rishi. And Vivekananda and Ramakrishna and many other Hindus, they're pretty liberal about these things. They say that eventually every single one of us will become a rishi. If not in this life, then in a future life. Thank you. Fortunately, none of us are going to hell. That's, that's the nice thing about Hindus. <laughs> Namaskar Swamiji, thank you very much for such a wonderful exposition of uh, Vivekanandji's thoughts. And now, now, that, now, now that in our midst, I have a question to have a dogni for a very long time, and I trust you'll be able to answer me on this. So from what I understand, the perception of Rishitva, Rishihood, transcends uh, religion, transcends schools of thought. But then in my limited understanding, there are philosophies that, that are dualistic, particularly the Abrahamic faiths. They tend to pause the difference between the creator and the creation. And then there's Vedanta and other non-dual thoughts, trains of thought, which essentially say that the creator and creation are one. There's no difference between the two. So given such a difference in the two streams of thought, dualistic, creator versus creation, and the whole idea of creator and the creation being one, how is it that the rishis of all climes and all cultures arrive at a common ground notwithstanding these uh, differences of theology? If yeah, you could that, that's a very good question. It's a very subtle question. It's one that's actually raised by a number of contemporary philosophers. I discussed this um, in some detail in my previous book, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, in chapter 6. It's called the conflicting claims objection. So the idea is that different rishis, different mystics in different religious traditions, even sometimes within the same tradition, like in Hinduism. Hinduism itself is a vast religion. We have Dvaita Vedanta of Madhva. We also have Ramanu's Vishta Dvaita. We also have Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. We also have Vallabha's Shuddha Dvaita Vedanta, Chaitanya's Chinta Veda Veda Vedanta. And each of them is, is claiming, here's what the ultimate reality is like. This is the nature of ultimate reality. But they conflict with each other often. And it's a good question. So in that case, doesn't the, the testimony of these different mystics and sages, don't they contradict each other? And in that case, doesn't that invalidate the validity of the testimony? So that's a very good question. The way I handle it is to use an example. This is not original to me. It's, 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 it was introduced by several Western philosophers. The example is this. I look up at the sky, and I see a plane. I, I see something in the sky, which I think is a plane, all right? Another person who's, you know, somewhat far away from me, he looks up at the sky and he, he sees that same object except he doesn't see a plane. He sees a kite. Another person, another hundred or so feet away, or f let's say further away, a f few miles away, looks up and, and says, yeah, yeah, I also see it. Let's imagine that they're all in, uh, you know, on, in a group chat or something on, on the phone. Another guy looks up and says, yeah, yeah, I see that too, but it's not a kite, it's not a plane, it's a bird. So all three of these people 
Their testimony is conflicting. One person bird, one person plane, one person kite, right? At the same time, what's the underlying commonality across these three forms of testimony? The fact that each of them perceives something up in the sky. And so all of their testimony, all, all three of these testimonials, strengthen the, the reasonability, the reasonableness of believing that there really is something up there in the sky. Even if the testimony conflicts at a more fine-grained level, at a more specific level. So similarly, what I would say about the testimony of mystics is that even if different, different mystics across traditions, within traditions, make conflicting claims about the nature, the precise nature of ultimate reality, the fact that so many mystics across ages and across traditions even claim to have perceived some ultimate reality at all, itself is, I, I think, the most important thing. So the way that Sri Ramakrishna would use the example of uh, an elephant, a giant elephant, most of you know this, and there are five blind men. Each one is touching a different part of the elephant. One is touching the, the tail, it's furry, and he says, yes, yes, I know, this elephant is furry. And another person is touching the trunk and he's saying, no, no, you're wrong, the elephant is scaly and dry. And they start quarreling with each other. But who is the person who resolves the conflict? The person who can see the entire elephant. And then he says, you guys are all being silly because you're all right. You're all touching parts, parts of the same elephant, but you're all wrong in thinking that the part of the elephant you're touching exhausts the nature of that elephant. And in a spiritual context, there's a very special kind of spiritual experience that Sri Ramakrishna had, which he called Vigyana. And I discussed this in detail in my previous book, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality. Because what the Vigyani sees, he doesn't see just one aspect of God, he sees multiple aspects. So he, Sri Ramakrishna would often say in Bangla, Vigyani dekhe jini nirgun tini shogun. The Vigyani sees that that ultimate reality, which is nirguna, without attributes, so that's the, Adva, that's the Brahman of Advaita Vedanta, is also saguna, is also with attributes. And Sri Ramakrishna adds, and manifests in infinite forms, as Kali, as Allah, as Brahman, as, as Vishnu, as Christ. So there are also, there's, if we talk about different kinds of spiritual experiences, there are some spiritual experiences where you realize God in a particular aspect or form. A Christian mystic might, might perceive God as Christ, a, a Muslim mystic as Allah, Hindu mystics as Krishna, Vishnu, Allah, or you know, Kali, any of them. But then there, there's another category of mystic who perceives God in multiple forms. And their testimony carries a, an extra kind of value because that testimony can help harmonize the apparently conflicting testimony of many other mystics across the world. I hope that begins to answer your question. Thank you. Uh, Namaskaram Swamiji. Yeah. Na Namaskaram Swamiji. I can't see you. I'm here, I'm here. On oh, okay, right okay. Side. Yeah. yeah, hi. Namaskaram. Namas Namas yeah. Uh, so my question is quite generic here um, because we are uh, all here are students. Uh, so we are all exploring into different domains. We are engaged in several activities. So I wanted to know what is the ideal path for us students, ideal path of Rishihood, according to you. What will you suggest for us? Well, according to me, according to Hinduism, there is no one ideal path for everybody. That's the beauty of Hinduism. Yeah. It's not a one-size-fits-all religion. And the way that Vivekananda would answer this question, I think, is that you know, there are four main yogas, according to Hinduism. And we all know them, I, I hope. But Karma Yoga, Jnana Yoga, Raja Yoga, Bhakti Yoga. And he makes some really radical statement sometimes, and one of my favorites is he says that no man is born into a religion. He says, each person has a religion in the depths of his soul. And the first step in spiritual life is discovering that individualized, that, that, that religion that is meant only for you. We're all, we can all be Hindus, we're all Hindus here. At the same time, each one of us as a Hindu needs to discover the, that individualized religion of our own soul. Why? Because if we follow our individualized path we will make the most rapid progress. That's the basic idea. So you have to first, to answer your question, you have to analyze yourself and you have to ask yourself, what kind, what kind of temperament do I have? What kind of personality do I have? You know, where do those things come from? It comes from Purva Janma Samskaras, from what we did in our previous lives. So one person who has been worshiping Krishna over many lives, in this life, from an early age, you'll find that that person has a natural yearning for Krishna without even, you know, consciously reading anything like Bhagavata or, you know, Bhagavad Gita, but there's this kind of natural attraction toward Krishna. Another one might be toward Ganesha. Another one toward the impersonal absolute. That would be more like Advaita. 
So there's no simple answer, but that's the beauty of Hinduism, is that you carve out your own path through self-analysis, and Hinduism gives everybody the scope to um, follow the path that suits them best. Thank you. Namaskaram, Swamiji. Namaste. I'm uh, noticing that in the world, there is a slight dichotomy, and I would like your Advaita thought on that as well. Um, so we have assimilators, like our own culture seems to be very assimilative. Uh, you have a personal experience, a perception, and then there is a, there's someone else with a testimony of a certain perception. We're assimilating that experience, and we're saying it's okay. That person has that experience. And then we have these non-assimilators as well, who are all about rejecting, uh, dismissing, or disregarding somebody else's perception. Uh, like you said, so many criticisms that Swami Vivekananda got. So these are two dichotomies. Uh, how do you uh, elaborate these two in our uh, experience? And as well, give an Advaita take on this. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm not entirely sure I understand the question, but what I'll say is, since you mentioned Rambachan, I'll just mention in this context, see, one thing I found is, <coughs> When it comes to Hindu, academic Hinduism, there have been a number of books criticizing great Hindu saints. There's a book, a notorious book published by Jeffrey Kripal in, I believe, 96, called Kali's Child, making all sorts of outrageous claims about Ramakrishna. Jyotir Maya Sharma more recently published a book called uh, Cosmic Love and Human Apathy, Swami Vivekananda's Restatement of Religion, something like that, uh, published by Yale, attacking Vivekananda as a Hindu supremacist, Ram Bachchan in 1994, as I mentioned in my presentation, uh, Limits of Scripture, he's criticizing Vivekananda's views on religion. Now, how do we as Hindus respond to these kinds of critiques? That's a very important and urgent question, I think, these days. And I'll just give you my take. I don't expect all of you to agree with it, but I think the best way to respond is through rational argumentation and response, and, and not getting emotional, not sending death threats, not freaking out, and not, not strawmanning that critic. Strawmanning means not, you know, you have to make sure that you're doing that critic full justice. You have to make sure you understand exactly what they're saying. Because that's the essence of intellectual dialogue and debate, which goes you know, back millennia in, in our great Indian spiritual tradition. Nyaya, in the Gautama's Nyaya Sutras, it lays down the terms of debate. Debate is something that we should encourage and that we should foster. And we shouldn't get upset if somebody is criticizing one of our figures. Give a reason response. So I, I'm, I'm saying that, but I also I, mean, I can give you more concrete examples. With regard to Jyotir Maya Sharma's book on Vivekananda, he says a lot of crazy things, but instead of, you know, name calling or you know getting upset or sending some email to him saying how dare you i wrote a long detailed scholarly response refutation of his book in a in a peer reviewed journal called religions and you can look at it it's called was swami vivekananda a, Hin a hindu supremacist revisiting a long standing debate and i spent months writing the article and then i published it within 2 days i got an email from jyotir maya sharma i was not expecting it and he said Dear Swami, Swamiji, you know, I just wanted to write a quick note. Regard, apart from you know, what we agree or disagree on, I am simply touched by the fact that somebody has read my book with that kind of care, with that level of attention, that you took the time to read it carefully and respond to it thoughtfully. For that, I'm very grateful. He wrote this letter. And so that's just an example of, I think that's the most productive kind of response. Thank you.
now being accepted in academia. So just wanted your quick thoughts on how much of uh, dependency does the principle of testimonial proof and perceptive proof have on culture and what constitutes in academia? Yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think the, the point about these principles is that they're extremely broad, right? And the idea is that it's supposed to transcend culture just because perce everybody perceives, even dogs perceive, bats perceive. You know, so human beings, just at the level of perception, that seems to be something that they have in common. But I think the, you, you have, there are multiple questions there, I think. And one of them has to do with um, what, are the, what are the preconditions for perceiving supersensuous realities? And you mentioned something like, you know, in our culture, we claim that yoga is necessary to purify the vision so that you can then realize God or whatever the ultimate reality is. Um, but in that context, what I would say is I think that we have to be careful about exactly what that precondition is. You said the, you use the word yoga. I would be careful and because if you say it depends on what you mean by yoga. And if, if we define yoga as spiritual practice rather than in terms of something narrow like Patanjali's Yoga Sutra or something like that or some particular yoga, whether it's Bhakti Yoga or come, then I think that it transcends culture. Because what about the great Christian mystics, St. Francis and the Desert Fathers, and what about the great Sufi mystics? They were yogis, but in that broader sense, so that they also cleanse their perception, they realize God in their own way. So I don't think that we should say that um, Hinduism has a kind of monopoly on, on spiritual truths because they alone discovered the right method to purify themselves and then realize these highest truths. I think that um, every religion, this is at least Vivekananda's view, that every religion is based on the supersensuous experiences of their founders. So in the, in the case of Christianity, it was Jesus. In the case of Islam, it's Muhammad. And uh, each one of us must, must do the same thing. We must become a rishi. Okay, we can talk later about that. Yeah, thank you. Anything else before we wrap up? Yeah, okay. I think I think it's time. Yeah. Thank